Okay, just a little update on some of what I've been up to electronics wise. This is my little camper. And this is a 72 uh, Okanagan product that I'm restoring. It's actually in really quite nice shape. The roof got taken care of. It's an import camper, so it's got the bubble in the top. And that gives you your headroom, otherwise you can see the edges like right there, the roof line. Anyway, I didn't have much for power in this thing. And so what I've done is, uh, I've got, now this is probably, turn on night mode here, brighten it up hopefully. Hard to see, and I, oh maybe I got flashlight here. Grab my flashlight to better illuminate what you're looking at. I should actually do a video on uh, on restoring old metal-sided metal roof campers. If you ever buy an old RV, um, get a metal-sided one. If you're buying a new RV, there's nothing wrong with fiberglass. Well. Anyway, the old metal sided metal roofed RVs you can work on and you can actually completely rebuild them from the outside in whereas a fiberglass camper is much more difficult to work with and I am an RV service technician so I do have the I do feel qualified to to speak on the on the matter I have rebuilt both from collision point of view and holy Moses I'm having a heck of a time getting this flashlight off of this thing okay here we go yeah metal side metal roof it's the way to go and these old ones are heavy as hell but this isn't a full size pickup so it's okay but that bubble is actually five eighths of an inch plywood <laughs> I thought of, I just replaced the roof vent and I found that Actually, five eighths of an inch plywood in the in the rooftop, so it's good and strong. I thought it would have been just a flimsy thing when I first looked at it. Okay, so here's my setup. I got two sixes in parallel, and I drilled a hole out the back. That's a little fan that runs, and that fan runs on solar off the roof. So no matter what, I can keep the fan going. I'm doing some work right now, so it's not blowing. But uh, two sixes in the series, and those are cheaper sixes. Those are Xides, 180 amp hour. They're not as good as Trojans, but they're they're uh, pretty cheap. They're like a, a, a boat. you can get them for about 119 or 129 a piece. Had I have known, I could have got Trojans for 185. I thought I was going to pay over two for them, but I can get them for about 185 at Lord Co. So uh, you know, Trojans better battery. But anyway good heavy um, you want to have a good heavy series connection zero gauge and um, for your inverters you want to have good heavy wire there too that's uh, that's one gauge both on the negative and the uh, the positive I've got one gauge now that over there the black line is the inverter cable this here is just my DC power to my tamper and of course I have that white line that you see over there in front of the light um, that comes in down at the bottom you can see it comes in the wall there and that is going to my alternator which is running off of a relay so I have a diesel motor in this truck so I got two batteries up front when you kick over the ignition she's charging these in the back so every time you drive the vehicle it's charging and you want to run 10 gauge minimum that's 10 gauge wire and it's on a uh, 8 gauge fuse assembly you know those giant fuses and I'm running a 60 but I probably should be running a 40 amp fuse what happens is if you let these die or you know you discharge them fully which I don't have that I'm not gonna have that problem because I got solar panels on the roof but if you do, like, let's say you let those down to 11 volts and then your batteries up front are 12.7 or something, well, what's going to happen is, is when you turn the key on your ignition, it's opening these batteries in parallel to the running batteries and um, you get an inrush of current that's astronomical. 
okay you'll probably blow a 30 amp fuse easy because they'll want to draw a ton of current off those other batteries and that's why you want to make sure that you don't just use a standard auto fuse and that you use a eight gauge fuse assembly and that you know i don't know if you've seen those but they're big they're they're not small at all they're very large fuses they look like normal um they look like normal fuses but they're much bigger basically okay so and then basically it jumps over to this 1500 watt inverter that i have so one of the things that i can do is i can run this fridge um i can run it on um ac while i'm driving or i can run it on dc and i'm not so sure that there's much of a difference really because it's probably just a transformer that steps it down to 12 volts when you're running it on AC. But I'll have to look in it. Like it doesn't have a proper compressor. Um, it just has like a thermal thermal thing. Okay, so that's that anyway. And uh, I'm going to bear with me here. I'm going to shut off some lights in this camper. And I'll show you the project that I did as well. So the panel's still got to go on the roof and gonna put a charge controller in here probably be a cheap one just a PWM for the amount that I use this setup and all right so that's the beast old Chevy look at that beautiful cancer all around the wheel wells look at that just gnarly but she's a good old 4x4 she's not bad all right, so now I'll take you to show you my other picture. Now here's something along the way. As I enter this area, you can see I just shut off my flashlight. You can see how well lit this is, eh? How well lit this area is. That there, 75 watt high pressure sodium discharge lamp. It's only 75 watts, absolutely illuminates this whole area in the pitch dark. You can't do better. You cannot make an LED light that is as efficient as those. Look it up if you don't believe me. They're excellent lights. And what it comes down to is the amount of watts that it takes to produce lumens is less for, a, for an HID high voltage discharge lamp than it is for LEDs. And that was something that confused me. For a long time, I always thought, oh, LEDs are so efficient. Actually, no, they're not. Fluorescence and high intensity discharge lamps are more efficient at creating lumens. Okay, so here's my little project for today. This is a little pack and go solar charged battery bank made up of recycled UPS batteries. Okay, and um, pretty straightforward. It's got a shunt regulated, not even pulse width modulated, cheap ass charge controller. And there's a reason for that. One, they're cheap, very cheap. Like in the States, you could probably, online, you could probably get one on eBay for nine or ten bucks. But there's a reason why you'd want to use that. Um, and that is that you can hook up. Although it says you can hook up to 105 watts, 7 amps, you can hook up an extremely small solar panel to this, like 5 watts, or even smaller, like 1.8 watts or something like that, 2 watts, and this charge controller will still work. And it, its consumption of current is extremely low. All it does is illuminate a tiny little LED at about like a quarter brightness probably using 10 milliamps and I think the circuitry itself uses about 10 or 15 milliamps and that LED is probably running at like maybe 5 or 8 milliamps so the consumption is very very low now I've been running this TV set playing a VHS tape off of this now this TV set as you can see no, no trickery or nothing here um, the cord for the TV itself is this one, okay, and the ends in my hand, all right, 
and it is 12 volt TV you can see I've got it plugged in back here and then that goes over so on the side of my box I have a cigarette lighter jack so that I can pull 12 volts off of a standard cigarette lighter plug this has been running for oh about about uh, I would say about a half an hour or f 45 minutes or something but I never did get these batteries fully charged and you can see now it's gone down quite a bit it's, it's running this load which is probably a 6 amp load well it's less than 6 amps actually because I have a 6 amp fuse in there and um, it's running this load at about 12.27 right now but these batteries weren't fully charged and this is what I find to be typical with these UPS's you'll get them and they won't come up past about 12.86 12.99 and then I run them through the Tesla oscillator uh, and I do just this I discharge um, the batteries this is a little bit heavy of a load per se for this amount of batteries because you're looking at about 7 amp hour batteries so over over a 20 hour period let's say these batteries you know shouldn't be running at an amp and a half because they're not 25 or 30 amp hour batteries um, and an amp and a half times four is roughly about what this TV draws so this is a little bit of an in intense draw so I won't take this down too much further like I'll take this down to maybe 12 volts and that's good for this discharge the next discharge I do I'll do with like a 20 watt load let's say and um, there you go now probably the most interesting point of this whole video is what I recycled today is it came in this case here all right and it had six of those style batteries all right and this is how big it was to give you an idea um, it had six of those seven amp hour batteries in this thing and um, they were running at 36 volts now this is not this is not the full UPS system what this is is an additional battery pack component that goes with the matching inverter and everything else now when you can get your hands on these it, in a way it's better because they're batteries that's all these are and typically what you'll find is a couple of your batteries or at least one like in this case at least one will be sitting between 9 and 10 volts and the rest will be up but that one battery is just bringing down the whole system and for whatever reason sometimes it doesn't take out all the rest of the batteries and if you run them through four or five cycles on a Bedini or a Tesla switch oscillator style Bedini which I prefer um, you bring them back up now those batteries there those batteries there um, they're what I usually call what I hope for is a 12.9 battery in other words when it charges up and rests overnight all it does is sit at 12.9 or 12.99 or something like that under 13 when you go through revival you'll find that they'll come up to about 13.2 they'll never hold the original 13.5 but 13.2 13.3 now the other interesting thing is is if you put them on MPPT solar charge control which I'm not here um, but like in that larger bag that I saw that in turn also desulfates batteries I'm, I'm quite convinced of it and I'm not surprised because what it does is it sits there and it pulses the bank with waps of current and the frequency is always changing so it's setting up sort, sort of a um, harmonic rhythm as well that you know at times matches whatever it takes to desulfate batteries and uh, you know it acts like a PWM pulsing large portions of current at the system especially when you've got you know over 300 watts worth of solar panels but sorry like I said I was gonna get to the interesting part here's the interesting part alright if you pull 
if you find one of these battery banks, when it's just a battery bank, you always get a breaker. Okay? Now, if you look closely at that breaker, look at that. It takes 87 and a half amps, all right, to trip this sucker. And your um, maximum voltage is 80 volts. You do the math. 80 times 80. Whoa. And that's DC. You look at that, okay? That is a DC rating. You can see right underneath the 80, it says DC. Instead of a frequency like 50, 60 hertz, it's got DC. So what that baby is right there, is your absolute best thing for disconnecting your solar array from your charge controller. Because you can do that without destroying the switch. You're not going to get any arcing. Now, of course, it'll be it'll act as a breaker and it'll trip if you if you got more than 80 amps coming in. But um, you know, most people's systems, you know, for example, if you have a couple of 140s and you're running 280 amps, well, you're going to see 16 amps on a good sunny day. On a perfect setting, you're going to see 16 amps. So that's well below what it takes, and you get some nice big. Heavy lugs, but I don't know what these are worth, and I'll look into it. But I'll tell you what, for free, they ain't cheap. These are not cheap things. They're probably 30, 40, maybe 50 bucks a piece, and they're exactly what you want because what you can do is you can shut down your solar right in midday sun. Let's say you got 16 amps coming into your system, shut down your solar setup. And then you can throw, you can change the system up. See what I do is my input connections on my charge controllers go to large clamps, okay, large uh, battery clamps basically. See the other thing I get for free is um, like big battery chargers for example. Like see this, this big huge big ass 30 amp shoemaker battery charger doesn't work anymore so somebody got rid of it well I got these huge mother huge mother cables right like that's that's four gauge or six gauge wire like thick wire right to run 30 amps or whatever now I connect these fat wires to the input on my solar charge controller and then I have a big brass rail or sorry a big copper rail for positive and negative and then I have a physical wall that creates a, a physical uh, barrier between positive and negative. And then I might have a charge controller up here that I can connect. And then I have a, another charge controller. So what I'm saying is, is you can disconnect your solar array and have five or six different charge controllers, each in control of their own bank of batteries. And on a sunny day, when one finishes, you trip that and then you you connect your other setup whereas you wouldn't want to just hook up a whole bunch of solar charge controllers to the same input source right and it's the poor man's way to charge more than one bank from um, from a single array and still keep the array instead of busting up the array and assigning one panel to each thing you keep the the array full you know, full power coming off the array with a DC disconnect. And that's why I'm so fond of DC disconnects. And this is how you can get them for free. Thanks for watching.